I feel like a lot of people who watch wrestling now, younger fans, don't realize that you've been around the wrestling industry since you were like 13 years old. I think that, I mean, even when I watched, I rewatched your documentary to prep for this, and I'm like, man, it's crazy to think, like, I couldn't picture now a 13 year old infiltrating the wrestling business in the way that you did. And back then, they were running even qualified D1 athletes out the door by breaking their legs in, in the Tampa Sportatorium and having you walk in the door and getting stretched and hooked by Jack Briscoe and Jerry Briscoe and Bob Roop and Hiro Matsuda. And, you know, and here comes Mr. Hattori, who's about five foot four and 115 pounds and would stretch everybody uh, that, that would walk in, you know, 300 pound football players, you know, would just, would just get their asses beat by 115 pound Masaha Tori. So, um, and then that's how you broke in newcomers to the business. And certainly someone who wasn't an athlete and I was never an athlete and certainly someone who wasn't qualified to, to say, oh, one day I'll take all these bumps and we'll all make money together. Uh, <laughs> that, that wasn't going to be me. But, but I, 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 I just was in the right place at the right time with the right set of circumstances, with, with the right moments that just I lucked into that got me accepted enough to where once some of these very hardened old school veterans would just hear some of the ideas that I was very eager to pitch. <laughs> um, <laughs> They're like, well, okay, you know what? The kid sees this a little differently. and But it was always based on, on, on an enormous amount of respect. An enormous amount of respect for what they did as performers for, for, for the art form of it all. And, and, and I, I think that they, that they understood that. And just the, uh, the, the level of respect that I had um, allowed me into that locker room, you know, that allowed me to be... Uh, accepted by a, a, a crop, a roster of some very salty uh, legends <laughs> that would not welcome even people that were going to be coming up through the ranks of the business. And I was only a teenager. You know, who was the first one to befriend you of that old guard that kind of like did listen to your ideas? Arnold Scoland. Arnold Scoland. You know, uh, I mean, and, and 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 it's funny because to me that Arnold Scoland will go down in history. As, um, as the, the manager for Bruno San Martino, the manager for Bob Backlund, the golden boy Arnold Skolin. When in fact, what Skolin should go down in history for, besides the fact that he was one of Vincent James McMahon's original partners, mm -hmm. uh, besides the fact that he and his wife Betty built, uh, certain of the, uh, of the, of the smaller venues, like, like the Westchester County Center in White Plains, New York, uh, for Vincent James McMahon, for the Capital Wrestling Corporation. Uh, but Arnold Scoland was the, the 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 Brock Lesnar, the Kurt Angle of of his day. He he was the toughest man in the industry. He was a hooker. It wasn't just a shooter. He he would hook people. He you know separate tendon from bone. <laughs> yeah. um, when when Vincent James McMahon took over the bookings for Andre the Giant in Japan from Frank Valois, he sent Arnold Scoland with Andre to stand ringside in case anybody tried to double cross Andre. <laughs> That's so crazy. So if you're actually sitting there thinking, oh, you know what's be a good idea today? Let's double cross the giant. <laughs> The same giant that dragged Blackjack Mulligan out into the ocean and tried to drown him. There's, you know, all these legendary Andre the Giant stories. You know, who's his bodyguard? Arnold Skoland. Think about this. What was San Martino's reputation back in the day? What was Bob Backlund's reputation back in the day, you know, for, from the NCAA, from being an amateur wrestler? Who was their bodyguard? And make no mistake about it, Arnold Scoland was ringside in case some other promoter paid off somebody to hit the ring and take down Bruno San Martino or take, hit the ring and try to beat up Bob Backlund, which anybody that you talk to from that era will tell you was an impossible task. <laughs> But yet, if you happen to have this thought in your head, you also had to take into consideration, uh-oh, I have to deal with Arnold Skoland. What a frightening human being this had to be. And he, uh, he I, I got my first press pass from him because Vincent James McMahon sent me down to the Holland Hotel on 42nd Street and 8th Avenue in New York City to pick up my press pass. And he was like, where are you from, kid? Oh, I'm from Westchester Island. He lived in Elmsford. So he, he was very close and invited me to the Westchester County Center. And 
let me do the programs for the event so I could make, I make a little bit of money while I was there. And I ended up helping set up chairs and everything else. And, you know, I'll come in the back, we'll take some pictures with some people. And, um, you know, what did you think of the show? And then I would tell him my honest thoughts. And he was like, oh, okay, you look at this thing a little differently than, than everybody else. Yeah, I try to. Was, you don't need an opinion that you already have. And then he would, t- you know, hey, Monsoon, come here a minute. Kid, tell him that idea that you had, you know? And it's like, Simply, you know. This is a- 13 when this was happening? Uh, a little older. A little older. It was, it, it, I, I really started to get into the mix after Shea Stadium, which was August 9th, 1980. So by the time we hit the garden in September, I had just turned 15. Okay. And that's when I really started to get to know people and ended up driving Freddie Blassie home uh, when he forgot his... Stuff for Allentown and Hamburg, even though I didn't have a driver's license. So, <laughs> but well, for, you know, Freddie Blassie, Grand Wizard, Lou Albano is another you know, yeah. group of guys who you know famously took you under their wing, yes. gave you wisdom and stuff. Um, just like what was, what was that like working with those guys? Those three guys are such legends of the industry that like not a lot of yeah. people have stories with anymore. See, it's funny. I never really looked around my environment and went, "Wow, I can't believe this is happening." I've always felt this is supposed to be happening to me, or this is what I want to be happening to me. So how do I create the environment in which it does happen to me? You know, yeah. um, it, it's like when I was a kid, I used to I used, I, I, I used to scribble, which made my mother so happy with me, uh, <laughs> on 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 my wall, make it happen. You know, I was like, I really like that with an exclamation point. Um, and, and and then as 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 I got a little bit older, it was, it was three exclamation points because because one wasn't enough of an emphasis um <laughs> but that was it i never i never like looked around going like i can't believe that the grand wizard and freddie blasi and Will Bano are teaching me the you know the secrets of, of how they've held this fiefdom in the wwwf for so many years i couldn't imagine life being any different than them doing it with me because that's the position that i wanted to be in and then you have a choice in life of either making that happen, seizing the moment, capitalizing on the opportunity, ex- exploiting when the circumstances come together, or you don't, and you don't live out your dreams. I've, I've, I've just been very myopic in my um, viewpoint of dreams are there to be chased and to be lived, and the moment that you live them, you go after the next one. Uh, so I, I, I just, you know, when people say, what was it like? It was supposed to be, you know, it was, I don't know. What was it like? You know, and, and, and this is going to, this was I'm so egotistical and so arrogant. And uh, I, I don't mean it in that way, though. It, it'll be accepted in that way. Uh, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, what was it like for them to have this kid, you know, that, 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 that you know, like, like they all adopted, you know, I was, like, I was like the bastard child of the three wise men of the East. Yeah, well, it reminds me of like that show Young Rock, but with a little Jewish kid, you know? Like- <laughs> yeah, oi, oi, vey, but a finish. How could you do this in the garden? In the garden? Let's get a Kanish and talk about it. You know, it's, uh, I don't know. It's, 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 it's what I was meant to do, you know? It's like, I can't, I can't imagine the trajectory would be any other way. I actually completely understand that. Like, I, it's funny that you say make it happen is like your mantra was your mantra growing up because that's always been my mantra as well. And that's crazy for me to hear you say that because like my whole life, my dad was always just make it happen. That's what he always said to me. Anytime I wanted to do anything, go out for anything, it was just make it happen always. And so uh, that's always been my mantra too. So I, I actually completely understand that in yeah. some weird way. Yeah, I'm also, I'm also, I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid of failure. Yeah. And we're all going to fail. I mean, nobody bats a thousand. You know, I, again, you, using the wisdom of my father, my, my, my father used to say, in his best year, Ted Williams, Ted Williams was sent to the dugout six out of ten times that he was up at the plate. And they made a big deal when he made it to four out of ten, he made it to first base. And it's like, when you look at it from that perspective, you know, okay. And then again, you know, you, 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 f- failure failure just means you tried something that either the circumstances dictated it ain't going to happen for you yet, or you weren't ready, you yourself weren't ready to achieve that goal yet. But, but you learn along the way, and you learn what went wrong, and either you apply it to the same pursuit when you go back for it again, or the next pursuit that you make, you say, okay, wait a second. I'm going to get something out of that failure. I'm going to profit from that failure. I'm, 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 I'm going to get something positive 
from that failure that then I can apply to this and, and this goal will be achieved because that goal wasn't. So maybe that goal was the sacrifice. Yep. Was, was the collateral damage for this goal to actually happen. Yeah, that actually makes complete sense to me. But what is, would you say though, if there's anything, cause you did learn from three of like the godfathers of, of managers, oh, you oh, know? Yeah. Uh, is there anything that they taught you that you still hold to this day? Like just like the main things of being, you know, an advocate or a special counsel to someone? You know, it was it was it was a lot. You know, it, it was it was um, because they were such different people, and such different characters. You know, Al, Al, Albano Albano always thought it was you know Captain Lou Albano presents Ryan Satin. You know, All right Satin. You know, just stick with me, kid. You're gonna be fine. I'm gonna, I'm gonna you know, you're, you're gonna be you're, you're gonna be Lou Albano's top guy. And then to Albano, that was always a designation. It wasn't Bruno San Martino versus versus Ryan Satin with Lou Albano. It was Bruno San Martino's program with Lou Albano continues and <laughs> Satin is is this month's flavor of the month. You know, um, Freddie Blassie always viewed himself as the star Freddie Blassie. He also understood better than Albano that his role was a supporting one. But he also understood coming, you know, going back in that day, Freddie Blassie stopped wrestling full time in 1972. And he was a huge, huge attraction for years, everywhere that he ever went. New York, California, Japan, my dad still talks about him. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I mean, I mean, this was this was the biggest. You know, if gorgeous George had become a manager, he would have been Freddie Blassie. So Blassie always had the ego tug of letting you know, I'm classy, <laughs> Blassie. <laughs> we drew twenty two thousand with with my guy in the main event. I drew twenty two thousand with me in the main event. You know, <laughs> yes. so. It was, uh, and Blasi always had that internal struggle, but he did understand his role. No one understood the role better than Ernie Roth, uh, the Grand Wizard. He, 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 he was a, 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 a voracious student of the game itself, uh, and 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 he would obsess over where he would stand, how he would stand. Uh, should, uh, should, should I be this much over your shoulder or this much over your shoulder? What makes you look bigger? What, 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 what brings more attention to you when you say your words? So he, he always, you know, Blasty would do a promo and then his guy would do a promo. Albano, no one could ever figure out where he was going to go. He would just come on and just start ripping and babbling and pissing off Vincent Kennedy McMahon, the, the, the announcer. <laughs> but Ernie would always um, want to develop a routine. You know, I'll say this, which leads into that. Or he'd ask superstar Billy Graham, or he'd ask Don Morocco, or he'd ask Greg Valentine, or he'd ask uh, Bob Orton Jr., or he'd you know, or he'd ask uh, Sergeant Slaughter. You know, any, any of the guys that he would work with. Um, what do you want to say? Well, I want to say this. Okay, I have the perfect lead in. And he'd give you the lead in that then transitioned perfectly, you know. And they all had their merits in how they approached it. And 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 they all had their ways and they all had a vision, you know, and and they all apply. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, when I was watching, because I mean obviously that's not my era, so I went back. And I was just while race, research, uh, researching for this, I went back and I watched a ton of their promos just for fun. Um, and I got caught in like a, a wormhole of just watching them because they're all yeah. so good. And they all do such a great job of just commanding your attention the whole entire time. Mesmerizing, mesmerizing, yeah. you know? But, um, but again, they, they, they're so different in their approach. Um, doing doing what Albano did is is a complete violation of what Blassie did, which was a complete violation of what Ernie Roth did, which was a complete violation of what Albano did. But I also noticed, you know, it's funny that those three guys helped mold you because I did notice in watching their promos that you do seem to kind of like be a combination of the three of them in some way. Oh, how could I not be influenced by them? And, and how could I not want to pay tribute to them while I do this? You know, I mean, th th there have been... A lot of very talented people that have that have had the opportunity to pick up a microphone here in WWE in the past twenty years, but nobody has been the, the you know manager, spokesman, uh, advocate, special counsel to the degree that I have. 
Um, so in, in many ways, as the three wise men were to Vincent James McMahon in the Vincent Kennedy McMahon era, where, where all managers were, were gone, um, I, I brought it forward into a new, into a new generation uh, from the old generation.